All right, guys, so this is the third video in the pharmacology section. Uh, what, what you'll know is, you know, when I, when I teach this stuff, I like to, you know, I'm just a big proponent of just keep reviewing, uh, you know, review, review, review. So at the, at the beginning of each one, I'm going to kind of, you know, review what we did in the last, last video or, or, and such. Um, so just kind of bear with me on that. So this is the metabolism, and it's big on that cytochrome P450. And you have to know that without a doubt. Um, but anyways, we covered that, so I hope you liked the video, um, but do me a favor, you know, as you learn this, uh, learn it as though you're going to teach it to the next guy, I mean, because that's the level that, you know, before you move on with something, you know, make sure that you can, you, you understand it enough to where if, if someone were to say, teach me it right now, that you could do it without notes, um, you know, that, that's what I recommend, that's, that's really where I'd like to see you um, to get to. Um, but if it is helpful, do me a favor, kind of uh, send it, share this video with a friend. Uh, the more subscribers that we have, it's the more that we feel like, uh, you know, it's, it's worthwhile keep doing videos and stuff like that. Because it is, it is fun on this end. It, it's enjoyable. Um, I like doing it. So I um, hope you like the video. All right, guys. So let's just kind of review, uh, review what we know so far. You know, we've talked about pharmacokinetics, and that's what the body does to the drug. And we talked about how, how the oral medication goes into the gut goes to the liver uh, via vein to the heart and then to the lungs and then back to the heart. You know, the left side gets pushed out to its destination. So it's a very long way between where it starts and where it needs to go. And that's why the oral has a, it's a, is, you know, has a pretty much a, a bigger time to the maximum concentration or, or a bigger Tmax than say the anesthetic, which goes in real fast, gets a high concentration and has a very short uh, Tmax. So we talked about that. You gotta understand how to interpret basically a graph of the comparison of those guys, how this would be the anesthetic, uh, pretty much an IV, and then the oral is gonna have, the, again, the longest uh, Tmax. We talked about how the absorption, uh, and, and with that, we said there's the types of absorption that we studied are gonna be the passive, the facilitated diffusion, active transport, and endocytosis. We said that the passive and, and facilitated diffusion all are gradient dependent, so it gets pushed. There's no ATP involved, but the difference between the two is that you know the facilitated diffusion has, has a carrier, so at some point, he could get saturated where, where it kind of levels off how much stuff gets pushed across, whereas just your basic uh, passive um, would just kind of be a straight line. As much as there, it gets pushed off into the gradient. There's no carrier protein. And then an active transport and endocytosis, both are ATP dependent. Then we talked about the distribution, and really what the, the take-home point with that is, is that say if you have a medication, what would make it um, you know, a very high volume distribution-esque versus low volume. And you need to know that a low volume distribution is between four to eight liters in comparison. You know, total body water is around 40 to 42. So low volume distribution will be four to eight. So if they give you that, you say, well, well what are the characteristics of something with low volume of distribution? And what we talked about, the main points are, is remember something's highly highly positive uh, remember that if it's the positive sign can't fit through there per se so it kind of sets in there and stays in the blood plasma so that would have a low volume distribution what else would make it stay in the plasma if it was highly protein bound or if it was a high molecular weight that would also be a very low volume distribution um, trait and also remember if it was fat soluble it would slide through and go around so if it's not fat soluble um, it would be more of a low volume, low volume distribution state. So now that we have that, again, pharmacokinetics, absorption, distribution, and we're going to talk about the metabolism. So a 22-year-old African-American male brought to a rural urgent care center uh, due to increasing seizure activity. He had begun having seizures after a motor vehicle accident when he was 18 after having a severe traumatic brain injury. He reports being followed by a neurologist who was on vacation and that he has been compliant with his phenytoin, 100 milligrams TID, or three times a day, for the past one year with no changes in dosing. Would the following be contributing to the patient's condition if given, uh, if given with phenytoin? Okay, so we look at our choices down here. So something was given with phenytoin that caused this guy to have seizures. So what do you think happened to the phenytoin levels? Did they go up or down all of a sudden over this past you know, week or whatever that, that occurred, or she started having more seizures recently. Um, so something in, interfered with the phenytoin to do what? To bring those levels down that, that kind of put him at a, a greater risk for having a seizure. And so one of these medications does that. And without a doubt, on the step exams, you better know the inducers and inhibitors. And this is mainly, we're dealing with what they call that cytochrome in the liver, um, you know, the P450 system. 
okay? Because there's a lot of medications go through this P450 system. And, you know, if you're taking medication that can either induce that system or inhibit that system, it's going to interfere with the medication, which is what it did here. So you have to know the inducers and inhibitors, period, okay? Now, with the inducers, ones that quicken the metabolism, okay? This is going to be your queen, barb, steals, fen, fen and refuses greasy carbs continuously, okay? This is probably in the step book or wherever we got this one. But now, this first one, quinidine, you know, people have told me in the past that they actually moved that one over to the inhibitor. But for right now, we're just going to keep it here because it makes, the, it makes the little mnemonic actually a lot better. So you just figure out where quinidine needs to go. I haven't seen that one on any, any exams because I guess it, there's a lot of debate. But anyways, for right now, it's going to go in our inducer because it makes it just the queen barb uh, thing works. The barb is barbiturates. Queen barb steals is going to be your St. John's wort. Okay, the P stands for phenytoin. Okay, so again, queen barb steals fen fen and refuses is going to be our rifampin. Our greasy is griseofulvin. Carbs is going to be our carbamazepine, which is interesting. It can be its own auto inducer at high levels. And then C stands for chronic alcohol. Okay. So again, the inducers, ones that quicken that process in the P450 system or would break down the medication quicker and where it's not available, is gonna be the queen barb, steals fen fen, and refuses greasy carbs continuously. Those are our inducers. Now the inhibitors, you're just gonna say magic racks, okay? Magic racks, now what do those do? Okay, they inhibit the P450 system. So what's that? what would that do to the medication? It would actually raise the level up. Okay, and that's not what happened here, right? This phenytoin level went down, so we know it's an inducer. But there's many, but if you took an inhibitor, it would actually raise it. The M stands for the macrolides, okay, which is basically your your like say Zithromax, um, erythromycin, you know, antibiotics. So macrolides. The M, I mean the A stands for amiodarone. And what kind of lab would you run if if someone's on amiodarone? They come in or something. What where do they test you on that? you check the thyroid, okay? Total side note. Um, so magic racks, macrolides, amiodarone. Here's your grapefruit juice, okay? If you're in Florida, you gotta be aware of the grapefruit juice. Uh, I stands for INH, for TB. C stands for cimetidine, okay? Kind of one of those proton pump deals. Um, and right, R stands for ritonavir. I shouldn't say proton pump, I just, I just meant GI. Um, I don't want to get anything, anybody confused right now. And then, because it's, it's the prozoles that are the more the proton pump, um, yeah, this, that, and that's not that one. So the A stands for acute alcohol. Uh, the C stands for cipro, ciprofloxacin, antibiotic. The K, keto, ketoconazole, if I could spell it, ketoconazole. And then S stands for sulfonamides, antibiotic, okay? So again, inhibitors, magic racks. Macrolides, amiodarone, grapefruit juice, INH, cimetidine, ritonavir, acute alcohol, cipro, ketoconazole, and sulfonamide. Any of these things would interfere with the medication that uses the P450 system and increase their levels. Anything that's in the inducer is going to take that medication and lower them. So back to this question. The phenytoin levels went down, right? Because usually they protect him from the seizure, but they went down. So which of these did he probably take that made his phenytoin levels go down? I'm looking for an inducer of it, okay? Grapefruit juice, okay, well, that's an inhibitor. Amiodarone, well, that's another inhibitor. Carbamazepine, okay, looks pretty good. Looks like an inducer, looks, looks nice. Cipro, inhibitor. And cimetidine, um, GI, inhibitor. So the only one is gonna be an inducer, it's gonna be the carbamazepine, but you gotta have this stuff memorized, guys. Yeah, I, I've seen it on a, each of the step exams, at least a question or two on it. And I know you're thinking, well, gosh, it's just a question, but I'm telling you, it's, there's nothing, there's not a better feeling on this exam than knowing that you're gonna get one of these, these questions right, okay? This one reads, a 76-year-old male with history of atrial fibrillation has been on warfarin and nifedipine. Approximately one week after starting a new medication, his ENR, his INR, excuse me, is 1.0. Patient's family is concerned that this new finding may affect their father from traveling on vacation. Which of the following would be a concern with this patient? So 
first of all, it's a warfarin. You got to watch out for this on the step exams. Warfarin. You got to know what's what will be the the the, the target range for warfarin, um, and you should know it's between two and three. Okay, two and three. So the INR. Um, Inter, you know, international normalized ratio. So in case you travel the world, you would, you know, it's pretty much a standard, uh, you know, kind of a standard unit per se from, from that perspective. So the target would be two and three. Now it's one. So what does that mean? You know, that's lower. It's lower than where it should be. So how do you know whether that's thick or thin? And here's a way you can do it, okay? Is that when I think of the INR, I think if I had a, a high INR, I'm up in the clouds, right? High INR is up in the clouds. And now what happens to the air the higher you go? When you go higher, the air gets thinner, okay? So a high INR is gonna be thinner blood, okay? And then if it goes, if the INR is low, okay? Again, it might, if I'm in warfare, my target's between two and three, and it's a lower than that, then that's gonna be blood is thicker. So if this guy has a 1.0, the blood is thicker, what would be my risks? Is it a hemorrhagic bleed, excessive bruising, iron cravings, intraocular bleed, or deep vein thrombosis? So first of all, if the blood's thicker, if the blood was thinner, then I'd be worried about a bleed, but it's thicker. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna get rid of all the bleeds, right? Cause it's not really, you know, the blood's thicker. So there's my hemorrhagic bleed, no, intraocular bleed, no. Excessive bruising occurs when the, you know, when the, the blood was thinner, you gotta worry about kind of like a hemorrhagic stroke and stuff like that. Iron cravings, distraction. What, what am I going to worry about? You know, kind of a clotting would be a deep vein thrombosis, especially if someone going on vacation, okay? But the take-home point on this, if you see warfarin, know what the normal range is, you know, and then say is it, because they could throw one at you and say that the INR was five, and then this gets reversed, right? Because then the blood is thinner, and you're looking for something like a bleed, a hemorrhagic stroke, da-da-da-da, things like that. But since it's lower, it's thicker, you got to look for the, the stuff that's going to make the clotting. Okay, and then this is kind of a, a follow-up question. It's the same same principle with that one with the person INR is one. It says which of the following medication may have contributed to this patient's condition? Oh, okay. So it's back to that um, originally kind of a uh, how, how do we say it's an inducer or an inhibitor? But with but what's unique is with warfarin, you got to be careful on this, right? Because it's in the P450. You know, warfarin's gonna come in here to the liver and then work and then kind of come through. But now this thing is low. So does that mean warfarin hung around longer or did it get processed quicker? And you know what, it, you know, what happened on that is that it actually got processed quicker, right? Because it, because it got processed quicker, it didn't have enough time to actually work. So that's why the blood got thicker. So I'm looking, what was my cause of this? Probably some type of inducer. Okay, some type of inducer quickly made warfarin go through here and then it got processed through and actually affected it and that's why instead of my INR being a nice in that little ratio, it went, it got a lot thicker. So I'm looking for an inducer. And again, you would go back and say, oh, well, I know my inducers are Queen, Barb, steals fen fen and refuses greasy carbs continuously and i'm looking for one of these amoxicillin not on the list butalbital you're thinking huh what's that um so keep a little question mark a macrolide nope i know that was on my inhibitors ketoconazole um was also on my inhibitors and metronidazole believe it or not it's actually going to be on pretty much on that side as well but the only inducer on this one you know they kind of disguised it it's this is a barbiturate right butalbital, you know, this bitol, okay? You gotta be careful on that. I've seen questions where they have the sicobitol, and it was a barbiturate, okay? And this is part of the, um, you know, you see it in like Fiora set. Um, butalbital, acetaminophen, and caffeine make up the Fiora set. But anyways, this is a barbiturate which fits right in to my inducer. And it was the inducer that processed the warfarin. And if the warfarin got processed too fast, it wasn't allowed to do its job and the blood got thicker. But be careful. You need to know how to work warfarin, whether it was an inducer or an inhibitor, okay? Because they could run this guy higher or they could tell you it was an inhibitor. And then again, you should know how an inducer and an inhibitor affect warfarin, what the INR would look like, 
And then what are you at risk for, whether it's a hemorrhagic stroke or, or some type of clot? And if you know those through that little process with warfarin, I mean, then you got it down, but you got to be able to work, work it, whether it was an inducer or an inhibitor, how it affects the INR, and then what are your risks, okay? So with that being said, it's kind of a, it's kind of a preview of kind of what's, what's to come. And, 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 you know, you guys have kind of seen this probably before, but I want to start talking about that half-life of the drug. And Jen, just to keep it simple, you know, it's, it's like this, you know, how many half-lives does it take to get to, to get to steady state? And if, you know, if I gave 100 milligrams of a drug and then it takes time, right? It takes time to get down to half of that, right? And so now I'm left with 50 milligrams. Well, I would give another 100. And then that would, 100 plus the 50 is 150 milligrams. And then it takes time, what's, what's half of that one? That takes me to 75, right? Again, I'm just taking half of this number. So again, it's a drug's half-life, half, you know, how long does it take to get to half of its maximum concentration? Well, from 150, it goes down to 75. Well, let me give another 100 milligrams, and now I'm at 175 milligrams. I take half of that, and I'm at 87.5, okay? Well, I give another 100. It's like I keep dosing another 100 milligrams of the drug because I'm trying to reach steady state, and that's 187.5, I'm sorry. And then if I took half of that, I'm at 93.75%. Uh, but if you see this, this is how the half-lives work, right? You keep taking half of the maximum, so half of 100 is 50. You gave a net, then you gave 100 milligrams again, because I gave 100 here, I gave 100 here, I gave 100 here. And that's just you dosing the drug, right? And so then I take half of that, 50. 150, half of that's 75, 175, half of that's 87, and so on. But if you see what's happening here, this line's gonna kind of flatten out, and then that's why it reaches a steady state. You know, if you keep dosing the medication, it's gonna pretty much go right in this little deal here. And that's why they say it takes one half-life, two half-lives, three half-lives, between four and five half-lives to reach that steady state. Okay, four and five half lives to reach that uh, that steady state, and, and that's where we're going because there's a lot of questions that are out there that I've seen that talk about when things st they start talking percents and what half life were you were you really at. Um, so this is where we're going, um, pretty much in the next next couple videos. But this one, hopefully, this video was helpful. Um, again, we just want to talk about the next phase of this pharmacokinetics, absorption, distribution, meta metabolism. And if you look on, you know, eventually we have this sheet. On that P450, you know, you got this CYP1A2, which is caffeine. The one, if I'm in doubt on my step exam and I tell people this and they came back and said, thank you, because I say, when in doubt, if they give you all these different options, go with 2D6. It's very common. It's a lot of the common medications, beta blockers, opioids, antidepressants, a lot of antipsychotics, they all are the 2D6. If you don't have all of it memorized, I would just I would go with that one as a basically just a default and no better different guess. You know the reason like example on this was like remember tamoxifen. You know before someone's given tamoxifen, they got to make sure that you're a good two D six um, uh, that you, that you can uh, actually have a good two D six system. You're not a poor metabolizer uh, of it because you need the two D six to make tamoxifen to be active because that's the one that works for the breast cancer. Um, so if you're not a good 2D6 metabolizer of it, it's not a good drug for you. Um, some other ones like Paxil and Prozac, big time in the 2D6. You know, I've seen people who were on, uh, say like they were on Adderall, and then they were given a Prozac by a primary care provider or something, and what happens is it's a 2D6 inhibitor. So what's going to happen? It gets inhibited. What happens to the amount of, in, of stimulant or amphetamine in your system? It goes up, and then they got psychotic only because they were originally taking Adderall, and someone gave them Prozac. So you really have to know these pretty well, I mean, in, in real life. Um, but anyways, we'll get to more of this in the next video, and um, hopefully it was helpful.